coming up next on Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. You can go through life, actually be involved even in a great church, and never have a handful of people you do life with who really know you, that love you deeply, and you love that. Welcome to Living on the Edge. My name's Chip Ingram, and I'm your host, and I'm sure glad you joined us. We're in a series on relationships, and we're going to talk about a very important relationship of, as Christians, believer to believer. And I want to talk about how to experience authentic community. You know, as a pastor for 25 years, I have seen scores and scores of people who come to church. They sit, they listen, they hear me or a pastor speak, they walk out the door, and they still experience the number one problem in America. It's called loneliness. You know, how do you break through that? How do you get to know people? Where, where do you find that deep, rich relationship where the reality of Christ and the love of God gets exchanged from person to person? That's today on Living on the Edge. We're gonna learn how to experience authentic community. Well, as we get going, sometimes you can get in session, 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 and you lose sight of the big picture. So I just want you, you know, no notes and no pencils. I want you just mentally to follow with me before we jump in. God has a dream for your life. And that dream, the net, net, the Reader's Digest version, is in Romans. If you want to experience the richness of his dream for your life, first of all, it's relational. And second, it's a non-performance. It's based on his grace. It's not earning his favor, it's understanding intimacy and relationship. And his dream plays out in verse 1, how a surrendered life. Verse 2, a life that is separate from this world's values. Verse 3 through 8, it's a life that is a sober self-assessment. Those are the beginnings of a real life where you experience God's dream and his grace, what he wants to do in you and through you. But now we're going to talk about not your relationship with God or yourself or even the world system, but the family of believers. And God has a plan, and a big part of that plan is how we relate to one another. Uh, I'll tell you how important this is. Um, it was a little over a year ago that my father died, 83, 84 years old. And you hear stories in passing. He was a Marine. He was disciplined. He was an alcoholic. And well, he, in his mid-50s, he came to Christ. And he had a lot of baggage, and um, he, I mean, three and a half pack a day guy, and uh, I mean, watching his life little by little change. And well, part of that hurt and part of those struggles, you know, I went through that kind of wounded son. We, we had to work through a number of issues over about a decade and a half. And um, my dad was from the, you know, World War II generation and hard to express his feelings, hard to articulate things, hard to um, sort of get involved with my kids and build relationship. And, and so I knew it was in him. It was so hard for it to come out. And then my mother died, and he later remarried a very godly, wonderful woman, and they had a great life together. And... Um, you know, but yet, it's, it's like we would get about this close, and <laughs> that's, you, you just longed for that to happen. And, you know, we would share, and we would talk, and then uh, he had a very unusual disease, and he was dying, and uh, it was a sort of a long process. And then uh, I got a call in uh, February, and they said, you know, if you want to see your dad, and this had happened kind of once before, but you, you need to come really pretty soon. He's not doing well at all. And I, I had a good friend who uh, has a, a little plane that he said, you know, he knew about my dad. When, when, that, when it happens, don't you dare go drive there. You call me. We can be at the little airport in 30 minutes, and I'll take you. You know, this plane, it's for my business. God gave it to me. I just want to help you. So said, wow. And so, you know, you're a little uncomfortable asking someone like that, but it happens, and I get the call. I call him, and he literally, he said, what's your watch say? And I told him, he said, I'll be there in 27 minutes. And uh, he flew me to Durham uh, from Atlanta. And, uh, you know, it was dark, and we get a car, and he and his son drive me, and they let me off. We'll be here in the car. We'll pray for you. And I went up and saw my dad, and, you know, he was, um, you know, not, not doing real well, and he was kind of 
having a low time, and his wife was there and some other people, and we said goodbye. I said, I'll just stay here with Dad for a little while. And everybody left, and it was literally like a gift from God. He popped up. Chip, how you doing? I said, I'm doing good, Dad. How are you doing? And I mean, for an hour and a half, it was like, I mean, these are your final words. I'll tell you what, I, I don't know what all the issues were and family issues and what alcoholism, blah, blah, blah. It was like, whew. I mean, we had, we had the best talk ever. And we shared hearts. And we talked about throwing baseballs as a kid. And we talked about just issues and dreams and, you know, things that I long to hear as a man. There's something your dad can give you that no one else can. And for an hour and a half, he shared the most significant things of my lifetime with him. And here's the deal. When you know you're going to die, you tell people the things that are absolutely most important to you. And I got to taste that. And Jesus knew he was going to die. And on the very last night before he died, he gathered those that he loved and those that were closest to him. And he said, I got a new commandment for you. And he gave him a command that's about how we relate to one another and the stakes how important it is about how we love each other and what it means if we do it and what it means if we don't. And after he gave him that command, then he went into the garden. And we get the longest recorded time of his personal prayer life and where he talks to the Father and he begins to think about what it was like when in absolute perfection the Godhead before he took on human flesh. And he began to express to him these men that God had given him out of the world and those people that God would give him later and the glory that what he wanted to share with them. And he says, Father, make them one, even if we are one. And with that same idea, this prayer, this passion, the last thing on the last night is what he prayed about how we would treat one another and the implications for those who don't yet know him. Listen to the command, John 13, a new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. He says, love each other how? The way I loved you. How was it? Unconditional, sacrificial, devotion, open, vulnerable, not when it was convenient, I met you where you were. I want you all, guys, to love each other the way I loved you. Here's why. That's how the world's going to know. The greatest, most powerful apologetic in all the world is not out of a book or an argument. The greatest apologetic in the world is Christians loving Christians radically, authentically, and from the heart in ways that the world goes, Whew, where do you all get that? And after that command and... The Passover turning into the Lord's Supper, he goes out and he prays. And I've taken an excerpt as we eavesdrop on Jesus. Think of this. The creator in the second person of the Trinity speaking to the Father on the last night of what's most important to him. My prayer is not for them alone, speaking of his disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Guess who that is? That's us. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us. Why? So the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me. And have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, listen to his voice. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me. I want them to be with me. Where I am and to see my glory. The glory that you've given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. We're going to talk about serving in love and developing authentic community. And this is not a, this is how to make your life feel better. This is not, oh, this is how to develop better relationships and here's seven steps for better relationships. What we're talking about is being the answer to the prayer of Jesus and obeying the command of Jesus that said how we treat one another and how we love one another is at the core and the primary power for a watching world to know 
whether God, in fact, actually sent him. And I've shared a little bit about my journey and my story. And now I was a skeptic. I'd never opened the Bible. I thought these people were Jesus freaks and a cult. Now, forgive me because I love the Fellowship of Christian Athletes now. That's, that was the camp I was at. And, you know, I heard this guy talk every day a little bit out of the Bible. I was, still wasn't buying. I actually read the Bible that one day, so at least I was starting to get open. But you, you, know, you know what turned my heart? Uh, we did all these athletic games and stuff, and they threw a bag of ice, and there would be a ring of us of 10 or 12 guys. We'd share hearts and talk a little bit, and the fullback for Illinois was there, and he was my huddle leader. And the wide receiver at the time for Atlanta Falcons, I don't know any of their names, about mid-70s. And I'm this, I mean, ring and wet, skinny, tiny little white kid and um, that has this basketball scholarship at a small school because I'm a small school guy. And uh, I'm not good enough to play at a really big school, but I'm just thrilled to get to play at a small school. But I've got to, uh, I've got to make sure I make the team and do well. And, and so that's my dream, and that's why I went to the camp. And I'm, I'm not hearing all this stuff about Jesus, and I just don't know what to believe. And, and then I watched this uh, wide receiver. I'll never forget he had green gym shorts on. In my mind, on TV, those wide receivers, don't they look like t- tiny little guys? They're only tiny little guys because the guys on the line are 330 pounds. <laughs> and I mean, I can still remember, weird in your mind, this guy had thighs like this. And this is real important and was very muscular because my view of Christianity was feminine. My view of Christianity was, this is for dopes. This is for people who can't think. This is for people who need a crutch. This is the opiate of the masses. This is people who need religion. I don't need all that junk. That was all my insecurity coming out. And I watched this guy, and they were walking, and the the fullback obviously had something troubling going on in his life. And I'd never seen this ever in my life. I was 17 years old, going to turn 18 in about a month. And that wide receiver put his arm around the fullback this uh, big fullback. I mean, these are two big guys. And I'd never seen a man put his arm around another man. And they began to talk, and he listened. And I, I could hear parts of the conversation. And then, you know, I'm just behind. They, they don't know me. I'm like a gnat. <laughs> you know? I'm just some little runny kid walking behind him. And I, then I, more and more, I could overhear the conversation. And I heard a grown man share the depths of his heart and his hurts. And I saw another grown man love him and accept him and express the love of Christ. And I'll never forget, I had this emotion welling up inside. And I'm just this kid, you know, you know, walking behind him like this. And I'll never forget. And, you know, I heard the messages in the Bible and this camp and this stuff about Jesus. And all I know, I came to a moment, I thought, I don't know what they have. That's what I want. I don't know what they have, but I know I'm an insecure, driven, over-the-top hypocrite, and I don't like me, and I pretend, and I project, and I don't know why I'm here, and I don't know where I belong, and I, I can set goals, and I can, you know, praise God for my dad. He taught me to get up early and make a difference and work hard. Thanks, Dad. But when you achieve stuff that doesn't mean anything in the long run, you just end up empty. And I heard Romans 12 and trusted Christ at that camp because I saw the answered prayer of John 17. And what I want you to know, if you're going to experience God's dream for your life, you have to be connected to other Christians. And I'm not talking about attending church. I'm talking about being connected from the heart with other Christians where the real you shows up and meets real needs. I mean, not what's convenient or what makes you kind of look spiritual, but where the real you shows up and meets real needs. And are you ready? You do it for the right reason, and then you do it in the right way, the way God designs. And I will tell you, when you begin to have those kind of relationships, there will be people watching that you don't know are watching, like the skinny little white kid chip behind these two great athletes, and they will begin to believe that God sent Jesus to the world, and that's what's at stake. And in verses 9 through 13 of Romans chapter 12, 
you are going to learn how you can have, experience, and give away authentic community. What Jesus prayed, Paul says, here's how you do it. And it's, a, it's an interesting, as you look at the whole passage, the passage is pretty interesting in that, you know, he says, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Then he goes on to, you know, talk about, you know, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing or pursuing strangers. And it just feels like he's saying, do, 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 do. Like there's all these little participial phrases. But all of them have to do with how we treat one another. They're all about believers. And I'm going to save you a little time because if you study this passage very, very carefully, you see that he puts them in triads. And, And if you want an outline, what he'll actually say is, When the real you, notice verse 9, meets real needs, verse 10, for the right reason, verse 11, in the right way, verse 12 and 13, you will experience authentic community. The who, the real you. The what, meeting real needs. The why, for the right reason. The how, in the right way. It's an amazing the way it's put together. And what I like to do is walk it through with you And as we walk it through, will you pray a prayer? God, will you show me anything I need to do to take the next step to have the kind of relationships that get connection like this, where I'm obeying the command of loving other people the way you loved your disciples and answering the prayer that you prayed on the very last night so that we might be as one, even as the Father and the Son is one, that we might be brought to complete unity so the world would know. Would you pray that? Just whisper it in your heart, God, you know? We get so busy. We do so many things. We get so program-oriented. We get so many things going. You know what? You can go through life, actually be involved even in a great church, and never have a handful of people you do life with who really know you, that love you deeply, and you love back. So let's look at it. The real you versus a projection of what we want others to think. We're back to this authenticity thing. So the real you has to show up. Not what you want people to think about you. And you say, well, where where do you get that? Well, there's two things that come out of verse 9. Authenticity and purity. It says, let love be sincere. Or literally, the word is without hypocrisy. And then the purity is hate what is evil, cling to what is good. That word for hypocrisy in in Greek theater of the time, it was done by all men. And uh, they would wear different costumes. And you've probably seen it, you know, where they have those, they paint those masks and they have the little stick. And they would put the mask. And then Greek theater, if you were a good actor, you could play the part of a woman, a child, a man. Often you play two or three different people and you learn to throw your voice. And you'd play different parts. And when you were the part of a woman, you'd have the face of a woman dressed like that. And, hello, love 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 I don't know what they did in Greek. And then if you were a man, you would come out and say, hey, I'm blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah. That's all real Greek type stuff, I guess. <laughs> guess what the mask was called? It's the word in your text. Let love be without a mask. Let love be without hypocrisy. The, when the real you doesn't show up, you never get loved and you never really connect. I mean, we, we're all living in this world. How many times do we sit with people And it's just filled with pretense. It's just absolutely filled with trying to make a good appearance. Just sharing enough so that we kind of, you know, maybe a little bit of our needs. But we don't feel really safe. And so we don't really share the things that are really going on and the things that we really struggle with. And we don't share the things that we really rejoice under because people will think we're trying to be too spiritual. But I'm talking about when the real you shows up without a mask. That's the key to the beginning of authentic community. In fact, I don't have time to develop the text, but in your notes, will you write Acts chapter 5, about 1 through 11? And I'll tell you the story quickly because I just want to make a point. The story is the early church is mushrooming. And a fellow named Barnabas, at the end of chapter 4, verse 36, has a little piece of property on an island called Cyprus, which would be like owning some property in downtown New York. Very choice. So he's a wealthy man. He gives a big gift. 
somehow, I'm just reading in the text here a little bit, the buzz gets around, they find out that he gave a big gift, and he's kind of exalted. You know, he's called the son of encouragement. And he's doing it for the right reason, the right motive. And so there's this couple in the church, Ananias and Sapphira. And they kind of hear about it, and they say, you know something, everyone thinks so highly of Barnabas. You know, I have an idea. You know, we've got a piece of land, why don't we sell it? But here's what we'll do. We'll tell people that it costs this much, and... Everyone will think, pretense, that we are generous and that we're giving all that we have. But what we'll do is we'll keep back this part and we'll have our cake and eat it too. It's a new spiritual thing they did in the first century. We'll have our cake and eat it too. And so uh, some of you guys will get that a little bit later. Don't, don't, hey, don't, don't worry about it. Others are going, Chip, it was funny. I would have laughed the first time, but okay. And so, so you know, they're going to appear spiritual and still have, keep a lot of their money back. Ananias comes in to see Peter. Peter says, he tells him the story. Peter says, why have you and your wife conspired? Or actually, why have you conspired to lie against the Holy Spirit? Bam, he drops dead. Judgment from God. I mean, this isn't sexual immorality. I mean, this, he didn't rob a bank. He's not an axe murderer. He pretended to be something he wasn't. Boom, he's dead. Young men come, take him away. His wife comes in. Peter wants to make sure, are you really in on it or not? By the way, did you sell it for this and piece of property? Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, we did, you know, because we're loving, generous, wonderful, godly people. Hmm, do we get a star? He said, no, absolutely. Bam, she's dead. And they take her out. And it says a great fear came upon the church. And, and so you get the story clearly. He says to Ananias, hey, when the property wasn't sold, it was yours. This isn't like some communist block. It was yours, private property. You own it. After you sold it, it was yours. You could give a little. You could give a part. You could give a lot. It's, you know, you can do whatever you want with it. That's not the issue. The issue is you pretended and lied to the Holy Spirit and to the body of Christ, and you portrayed yourself as spiritual, noble, godly, and generous, and it wasn't true. It's called hypocrisy. And the heart of fellowship and community and authenticity is honesty. And God says, tell you what, this is the first sin in the New Testament church. Very first sin. And God said, guess what? I take this one very seriously. Whew. I bet a lot of people told the truth. <laughs> I bet a lot of people weren't very phony for quite some time. You know why? More than some sexual immorality or more than other sins that we might think are more devastating, that would have sunk the church of Jesus Christ. God knew that if there's not authenticity in relationships with people, then the relationships would be phony. And the prayer of John 13, or the command of John 13 and the prayer of John 17 would never be a reality. And, and I say that just because we're, you know, the only hypocrite I know real well is me. And the issue is not, are you one? The issue is just the extent. We're fallen people. I say things, project things. I do it unconsciously. I don't want to do it. But I will tell you, I am asking God, and I'm praying, and I pray that you will, that the real you will show up, that you'll take increasing steps to be open and vulnerable and real and honest at every level. Because authentic, powerful, supernatural community can't happen unless the real you shows up. And the other thing that keeps the real you from showing up, notice the other phrase. It says, not only are you to be sincere, he says, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. It has been said that the one security against sin lies in being shocked by it. Carlyle wrote, what we need to see is the infinite beauty of holiness and the infinite damnedability of sin. When I have hidden sin in my life, the real me can't show up because I'm hiding something, so I have, to, I have to pretend. And so many of us in the body of Christ are asking the wrong question. How close to sin can I get without sinning? Is this rated R, or is it PG-13, or is it this, or is it this, or is it this, or can my money be used this way? Can I get this close to sin? And the Bible says, stop it! hate what is wrong. How close can I get to what's right? When in doubt, don't. A clear conscience, the blessing of God, the hand of God, heart of integrity is far more valuable than anything that might be. And we've got a whole 
movement and tilt in the church that's asking, how close can we get to sin without it really being sin? And then instead of looking at Scripture, we look at one another. He's kind of a godly guy, or I respect her, and she does this, or she does that, so I guess it's okay. And well, and then, and then we start taking the steps, and pretty soon, tell you what, if we put you in a time capsule 30 years ago and woke you up 30 years later, being today, you'd walk in the average Christian living room and sit down with the average Christian with their finances, and you would be in shock that they watch what they watch and do what they do with their money. But it's happened very gradually. We've got a body of Christ that's the most affluent in the history of the world in America, and on average we give 2.5% of our income, and we're in debt up to our ears. What's that about? That's about, if he doesn't have your treasure, he doesn't have your heart. That's debt is, debt is presumption on the future. Debt is, um, I don't trust God. Debt is, I got to have stuff for me now. Lack of generosity is, he's not Lord of my life. And little by little by little by little, these things have crept in. Authentic community begins when the real you meets real needs. 